Hi, I'm Leah Ahava and I am back with more neurodivergent headcanons. And once again, what was supposed to be a compilation has turned into a deep dive on a single series. In my teenage years, I had two YA fantasy book universes that I kept going back to, Tamara Pierce's uh, uh, Tors Hall books and Diane Duane's Young Wizard series. Rereading those books as a late, uh, a late diagnosed uh, ADHD autistic adult has been really helpful for processing my experiences past and present. I still love both of these series, but today I'm going to focus on Young Wizards specifically. Uh, first, uh, 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 let's uh, have a couple of uh, content warnings. Uh, the first one's obvious. This video is going to be full of spoilers. So if that bothers you, you'll want to read the books first. Second, the bad representation that I will be covering is so messed up that when I reread the series to show it to my husband for the first time, we actually skipped the sixth book entirely in order to avoid it. Um, if discussions of wizardry curing autism would upset you, then see the description for timestamps where that part starts and ends so that you can skip it. I'll start by talking about wizardry itself. In this universe, someone becomes a wizard by taking what's called the wizard's oath. This usually happens in early adolescence, um, which is perfect for a YA series. Uh, after they take the oath, uh, the new wizard has something called an ordeal. Everyone's ordeal is different, and it involves the person using their newfound magic to solve a problem which they are uniquely capable of solving due to their natural talents, their interests, and their perspectives. There are certain traits that make someone naturally suited to wizardry. Wizards tend to show traits of hyperlexia and be passionate about learning generally. They also tend to have a powerful sense of right and wrong and a drive to act rather than be a bystander. These traits are important for wizardry, which requires learning an entirely new language well enough to think in it, uh, lots of specialized research, and the courage to step into extremely risky situations to right wrongs at every scale. Wizards also develop specialties, which are areas of magic in which they have particular interest and expertise. And it just so happens that those traits are extremely common in autistics uh, and other neurodivergent people. Uh, so it should be no surprise that Diane du Duane wrote so many of her characters to be neurodivergent, whether she meant to or not. The first character we meet is Nita Callahan. So I'll start with her. Nita has adult autistic diagnosis written all over her. She has a combination of traits that cause her to struggle and need support, but are also invisible or easily ignored by others because she does fine in school and doesn't get in trouble. Uh, since as of book 10, she's never had an autism assessment brought up, it seems unlikely that she's going to figure that out until she reaches a stage in life where her coping mechanisms are insufficient for her needs. Diane, if you're watching, first of all, wow. Uh, but second, please cut Neats a break and let her get properly diagnosed in the next book. As someone who didn't figure things out until I was 29, I pretty much guarantee she will thank you. Uh, so what are those traits? Uh, we meet Nita in the most autistic way possible, hiding from bullies in a public library. Not just the library, the kids section where the cool, neurotypical 13-year-olds wouldn't be caught dead. Nita describes the book from her earlier childhood as being comfort, several books from her earlier childhood as being uh, comforting like old friends, and finds herself truly enjoying her hideout time. The neurotypical world has this concept of age-appropriate interests that many autistics reject. Um, it's not uncommon for autistic adults uh, to be into things that are supposed to be for kids, uh, like cartoons and stuffed animals. And uh, it is in the children's section of the library that the wizard's manual described, uh, disguised as a kid's book called So You Want to Be a Wizard, literally snags her finger with a binding thread and offers her the oath after providing some background information. Nita starts all out with wizardly specialty in living things. Uh, she can have whole conversations with animals, plants, and more. She picks up additional specialties uh, as the book uh, books go on as well, including reading the future, 
uh, wizardly research itself, and more. Autistics can develop a special interest in just about anything, but living things and in-depth research are both relatively popular ones. But none of that is really enough to conclude that Nita is autistic. Anyone can hide from bullies and be excited about talking with their backyard tree. But Nita has several other rather telling traits that I will, be, uh, I will try to be quick about um, because this video is gonna get really long. One, she's socially awkward and has difficulty developing and keeping friendships that aren't superficial before meeting Kit. We'll get to Kit, don't worry. Uh, her sense of writing uh, right and wrong are so strong that when she fails to read the fine print and accidentally signs herself up to be eaten by a shark as part of a complex wizardry to save the East Coast from following in the footsteps of Atlantis, she goes uh, through uh, with her role in the spell rather than risk everyone else by backing out. Plot stuff happens, and she obviously doesn't actually get killed in the second book, but uh, she had every intention of keeping her word. Uh, so Three, social conventions baffle her. Clicky, teenager, clicky teenagers baffle her. Uncomfortable clothes baffle her. Good luck catching Nita voluntarily dressed up. If you're looking for Anita, try libraries and museums before even thinking about a mall. Four, she's known for having a volatile temper. Uh, but she also has a shutdown response. When we're introduced to her, we learn Nita has a long history of shutting down rather than fighting back when words turn to blows. But even when outnumbered by bullies, you can trust Nita to lay on the snark. When she gets mad, Nita will snark anyone from uh, pitiful school bullies to the lone power itself. There's, um, there's more, but you get the picture. Let's talk about Kit Rodriguez. I'll be honest, I'm not sure about Kit. Uh, I don't think he's necessarily autistic, but he might be ADHD. Uh, less of the books are told from his perspective than Nita's, and a lot of his traits could either be ADHD traits or teenage boy traits. Uh, it's also worth noting that neurodivergent traits are wildly understudied in populations other than cisgender white boys. Different cultures can interact with different neurotypes to produce diverse presentations. Kit is Latino, and I'm not well-versed enough in that culture to analyze representation beyond stereotypes. Sidebar, to note that Kit is a great example of a character who's written with a minority identity without tokenizing. Being Latino is just part of his reality, it isn't his one defining feature, and it isn't a central plot point, but it's also not just mentioned once and forgotten about. His family members are also not one-dimensional, um, that balance is not achieved often enough, especially in YA fantasy, and this series started in the 1980s, so kudos. Anyway, Kit is prone to being understemmed. He's a daydreamer who has difficulty focusing in class and would rather have a silent conversation with the school's air conditioner than listen to the history teacher. He's a tinkerer whose first magical specialty is, surprise, mechanical things. Uh, he can hear the voice of his dad's old Edsel as well as Nita can hear trees. Uh, his impulsivity is literally out of this world, and he is more ready than the average human to try out alien cuisine. He's impatient and easily frustrated, but also loyal to his friends and family and has a deeply rooted moral compass. ADHD or teenage boy? You, you tell me. I've, I've only been one of those. So I mentioned uh, Kit's family not being one-dimensional, so now let's talk about his pretty definitely autistic and probably also ADHD sister, Carmela. Uh, Carmela is one of those fun character, one of the most fun characters in the whole series, and not only because of how much she annoys Kit with her combination of bubbly personality and uh, skill at making herself completely indispensable. She's also one of the only significant characters who's not a wizard, but that doesn't stop her from holding her own among wizards across the galaxy. Carmela's pattern recognition capabilities are so great that she learns the wizardly speech without a manual and deciphers ancient languages even the manual can't make heads or tails of. She's extremely extroverted in an analytical way. Uh, she loves studying how social structures work uh, and then treating uh, uh, the world, or worlds, as her stage. 
uh, she's interested in uh, what she's interested in and not what she isn't, and she wears her opinions loud and proud. These traits combine together into a young woman who's not afraid to doggedly pursue what she wants. She wants to help her brother. She doesn't want to be left behind. So what does she do? She learns the speech, learns how to maximize the use of the television kit accidentally magicked into receiving the entire galaxy's content, uh, and gets herself a gizmo she can use to defend herself as well as any wizard. She proves herself useful, uh, so useful that she ends up with her own world gate in her closet. So why isn't she a wizard? She doesn't want to be, and wizardry does not live in the unwilling heart. Many neurodivergent traits are also wizardly traits, but not all. Many neuro neurodivergent, uh, Carmela plays it cool, but she experiences demand avoidance. She knows wizardry is a serious commitment and responsibility and sees no reason to put that on herself when she can be involved in her own way with fewer rules. The details of her interests are in constant flux. She's constantly updating her fashion to keep people off balance. She doesn't even stick with boyfriends long enough for expectations to set in. No judgment, you do you, Carmela. Uh, the point is that wizardry is demanding and she's having none of it. Um, so I've saved uh, possibly my favorite character for last, Dareen Callahan, Nita's ADHD autistic little sister. Dareen is so relatable to me, but she also has certain traits I've been trying to develop in myself for basically my whole life. For the first two books, we only see Dareen through Nita's perspective. We see a nerdy, inquisitive little girl in Star Wars pajamas who's annoyingly adept at noticing details and putting them together into a bigger picture. Non-wizards aren't supposed to notice magic, but Dareen is onto her sister and figures things out on her own. So we know that she's far more perceptive than a typical kid. But in book three, we finally see things from Dayreen's perspective when she becomes a wizard herself. We learn that whatever hints we'd gotten about her in the first two books hardly scratch the surface of what's going on with this girl. Uh, we also get a better look at the sisters' early childhoods. When Nita comes home from her first day of kindergarten in tears, Dayreen doesn't get scared. Dayreen analyzes the dynamics and decides she needs to be bigger and badder than anything that can come at her. She decides to learn everything, and armed with hyperlexia, hyperfocus, and a library card, she sets out to do just that. Like Nita, Dayreen has a powerful sense of how things should be, but her response to people who go against that is completely different. If you say something hurtful to Nita, you might get snarked back but you're probably gonna get to her. The severity of that tapers through the books, but we haven't seen her grow totally past it yet. Um, if you say something hurtful or even something poorly thought out to Dayreen, she'll simply downgrade how much of her energy you're worth wasting. Dayreen is busy. Once you've been sufficiently snarked, Dayreen does not have time for your shenanigans. The downside is that Dayreen doesn't really have close friends. But, like Gabby and Vivo, she would rather enjoy her own company than conform to her peers' social norms. So she doesn't need wizardry the same way Nita did. Wizardry is something to learn, something huge, and Dayreen wants to know everything. She's competitive, she's analytical, she's impulsive, so of course she's going to go after wizardry as soon as she knows it exists. And of course the first thing she's going to do with it is explore the furthest reaches of the universe, help a sentient computer planet develop its first life forms, and then name them after her gym class. Uh, like a lot of autistics, Dayreen is not willing to follow a rule unless she's personally satisfied that the rule has merit. She doesn't consider the limits of what others have been able to do to be rules about what she might be able to do. Basically, she's not convinced anything's impossible until she's tried it herself. Uh, this exasperates people around her and gets her in plenty of trouble, but it's also why she's able to accomplish so much. There's so much more to Dayreen, but this video is getting long, and not all of the neurodivergent representation in this series is badass and uh, uh, growing into itself. That's because none of the characters we've co uh, covered here so far are neurodivergent in the actual canon of the books. Enter Daryl McAllister. Now things are going to get ugly.
this is your content warning. This is this is the part that uh, anyone uh, who would be triggered by this should skip. First, I will say that uh, Diane Duane made heavy revisions to Daryl's story in later editions of the books, but that is only available in ebook form, and I strongly prefer reading print. I haven't read the ebook, um, I ha so I haven't seen the revisions. But I will put a link in the description to an article where an autistic writer, uh, Alyssa Hillary, breaks down the differences between the two versions. Uh, this video is only going to address Daryl's story as it was originally printed. And we're going to do so in brief because I don't want to restate what someone else has already put work into. Daryl is a black non-speaker uh, who was stricken with autism by the lone power in order to prevent him from becoming a wizard. Is that iffy enough yet? Uh, it should be, but we're not done. Uh, everyone treats Daryl like a tragedy, and even the premise that uh, Nita and Kit should be keeping an eye on him during his ordeal on the grounds of his neurotype is ableist as heck. We later learn that Daryl isn't just a wizard. He's something called an Abdul, which is a major part of uh, the system of how power, lowercase p, gets from the powers that be, uppercase p, uh, two wizards as a whole. Abdul's are rare and they are so innocent that even knowing that they are Abdul's will kill them. This plays into a toxic phenomenon where neurotypicals infantilize autistic people of all ages. It also sets Daryl up to have friends who will never be fully honest with him and he will never know, know why. Another issue with Daryl's story is uh, that the ableism extends all the way up to the powers that be. We know from how Daireen uses her laptop that wizardry can be practiced without saying the words in the speech with your mouth. So why is Daryl's entire ordeal just saying the wizard's oath? Why did he have to say the oath with his mouth at all? Why couldn't he say the oath his own way and be presumed competent enough to have an ordeal that doesn't read as inspiration porn? But it gets worse because of course it does. The end of the book sees Daryl trapped in an eternal stalemate with the lone power, or at least a fragment of it. Uh, he's able to get out of this trap by leaving a part of himself behind while the rest of him goes free to live his life. Do you see where this is going yet? What part of himself does he leave? His autism. Or, to put it another way, Daryl cures his autism by choosing to leave the autistic part of his experience to be tortured until the end of time by the universe's analog for the devil. And that's considered to be a clever success and a happy ending. Ew. Including a black, non-speaking, autistic wizard who's more powerful than anyone around him was an opportunity to do something really great in the world of YA fantasy. But what we actually got isn't representation. What we got is dangerous. Uh, the particular book this uh, 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 came out, uh, this particular book came out in the 1990s, and I'm glad that Diane Duane was willing to listen to critiques and revise the story, but the extremely har uh, uh, harmful original is still the only one that can be gotten in print. Um, thank you for watching this really long video on one of my favorite series that I still love going back to. I'd love to hear what you think and what other headcanons you'd like me to talk about. Leave a comment, do all the other YouTube things, uh, subscribe, share, all that jazz. I'll see you in the next one, and thank you so much for watching. Bye!